in this clip we'll go through some of the questions which uh, students struggled most in the uh, midterm for econometrics. So here is the base model around which most of the questions were structured and here is the regression output. So let's highlight a few things. Firstly the issue about the scientific notation. So here we have 8.986e negative 01. This is equivalent to saying that this number is really 8.986 8.986 times 10 to the negative 1 and that of course means that this is the same as 0 0.08986 okay so this is how we read this scientific notation let us uh, think about how to perform a hypothesis test in here because that was one of the key uh, issues, the key skills you needed in the midterm and uh, one of the super important skills not only for the final but basically for the rest of your degree. So here is a hypothesis. Beta 2 equal to 0, 0 0.5 is the null hypothesis, beta 2 is smaller than 0 0.5 the alternative. That's the coefficient on uh, young driver number of young drivers so you have the coefficient in the standard error and then you have a t-test here 1.208 negative no 1.208 and a p-value now these two refer to this null and alternative beta 2 is equal to 0 and beta 2 unequal to 0 but that is not the set of hypotheses we are being asked here so that means you cannot use these two values but you have to use the yellow ones so we calculate the t-test beta 2 hat sorry that shouldn't be a beta squared hat that should be a beta 2 hat so beta 2 hat minus beta 2 divided by standard error of beta hat 2 and this will follow a t distribution with 42 degrees of freedom and our decision rule because we are having a right tail test is that we should reject the null hypothesis if and to complete the sentence it's now often useful to look at a at a little sketch right? because that cannot be rushed writing the decision rules absolutely crucial uh, and it will stop you from making silly mistakes so before we complete the decision rule let's think about this a little bit we are having a left tail test did I say right tail before I'm not quite sure so it's a left tail test because we want to reject the null hypothesis if our beta 2 goes smaller than 0.5 so what will happen is that if the beta 2 hat comes in small enough far enough below 0.5 at some point we will say okay we'll reject the null hypothesis if it doesn't if it's here on the right hand side of this value we say do not reject and the question is now what is that value at which we switch our decision so we will reject h0 if the t-test is smaller than some critical value and that's where this vertical line is so to com to basically complete the test we need to set a significance level and we need to understand how the test statistic is distributed now we already said how it's distributed it's t distributed with 42 degrees of freedom so let me sketch a distribution let's just say that's the t distribution L looks symmetric it is symmetric now if we set a significance level of 5% that means we're using that critical value that cuts off 5% of the probability in the left hand tail because we're having a left tail test so let's go to the t table and see what that value is we're going to the closest decrease of freedom that's 40 and one tailed 5% we set that the critical value is 1.684 now this the values here are the right tailed values so since we are symmetric around zero for the t distribution the critical value here is negative 1.684 so here we go reject h0 if the t test is smaller than the critical value of negative 1.684 and i recommend that you do these steps before you calculate the t test that will stop you from making silly mistakes so 
here we go our beta 2 hat is 0 0.2965 minus 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.2454 these are the values from the uh, regression output the t-test is negative 0 0.829 so with that value we can now use that and place it in our distribution okay so these are the values for the distribution I took some license I put both the beta hat 2 and the t-stat onto this graph and our t-statistic here is negative 0.829 so that's here and hence we are in the do not reject re region and therefore our conclusion is do not reject h0 so this is what you had to done to answer i think it was question four or part of question four so what this means is that we found evidence in the data that is consistent with the null hypothesis being true let's think about the p-value because that speaks a little bit more directly to that statement which i just made so here's our test statistic in the distribution that's this little asterisk value before we think about the p-value let's go back to our t-table and find another potential critical value let's say this one here the 10 percent critical value for one tail test that would be 1.303 but since we're operating in the left tail it would be negative 1.303 so let me just carefully sketch that into here negative 1.303 now since this was a 10 percent value the size of the area underneath the distribution to the left of that value would be 10 percent or 0.1 what else do we know about the area here well we know that we have a symmetric distribution so to the left of zero t value of zero the size of the dis of the area here would be 0 0.5 so but what we are interested in now is the size of the area to the left of our actual test statistic that's here where this asterisk value is so given the information we got from the table what we can say is that the p value is actually larger than 10 percent but smaller than 50%. So larger than 0.1 and smaller than 0.5. So this is from the table. If you have a software at hand like R, then you can use a function like in this case PT for probability T. And you can use that and find the exact p value. In this case, the exact p value is 0 0.2059. But you couldn't have gotten this value just from the information. It also wasn't asked for. So, what does that mean, a p-value of about 21%? It means that if H0 was true, the probability of obtaining an estimate power coefficient, so a beta 2 hat, an estimate for beta 2, as small or smaller than the one we actually obtained is 20.59 percent okay so there's basically a 21 percent probability 20.6 percent probability that if h0 was true we would get a coefficient estimate of 0.2965 or smaller 20.6 percent yeah that's perhaps small but it's not really uh, out of the usual so this isn't small enough for us to dismiss the null hypothesis or to reject the null hypothesis one in five possibility that's not so unusual if it had been much smaller smaller than our alpha we would reject the null hypothesis So let's continue with the next type of question that was asked and there was a question on the confidence interval for our coefficient estimate. In particular we were asked for the 
uh, confidence interval not for the estimate but for beta 4 so for the coefficient here on the jail variable okay now remember the beta 4 that's the true coefficient which is really unknown but we are assuming that it is fixed unless we are Bayesians we might learn about this in second semester but for the time being we are not so important the beta 4 is not a random variable it's a fixed value but unknown so what is a confidence interval so we'll call calculate let's start with the calculation before we get to the interpretation so we calculate the confidence interval with the following equation we take our sample estimate beta 4 hat and then add or subtract a term that term is t alpha half times the standard error of beta 4 hat so we need beta 4 hat and the standard error of beta 4 hat that comes from the regression output and then we need another value that will come from the t-distribution table. So we'll basically be taking our sample estimate, beta 4 hat, and we'll create a lower bound and an upper bound, and that will be our confidence interval. Now, depending on that value t alpha over 2, that confidence interval will be wider or narrower. So we're either subtracting t alpha over 2 times the standard error of beta 4 hat or we'll be adding that term. We will uh, the difference between the two different confidence intervals comes through this factor t alpha over 2. So that's a value from the t table. And it turns out if we use a larger factor that will give us more confident that our confidence interval contains the beta 4 and if we are building a narrow confidence interval we'll have less confidence that the beta 4 which we don't know what it is is contained in this confidence interval so you will remember from using the t-table that larger values of t are associated with smaller values of alpha. So let's say we set alpha equal to 5%, then we are building what's called a 95% confidence interval. So let's do the calculations. We're taking our beta 4 hat, that's this value, 1.687 then we need our standard error that's this value here 1.201 so it still has the scientific notation but it's e plus zero so it doesn't change anything and then we need this factor and that comes from the t distribution table we need to check still the right degrees of freedom so the degrees of freedom are still 42 so we're using 40 the closest value and when we are building confidence intervals, we are building two-tailed confidence intervals, and let's say 5%, so we're using that t-value, 2.021, not the value at the um, of the normal distribution which some students used in the exam. So that factor is 2.021, and therefore our confidence interval will be 1.687 plus minus 2.021 times the standard error of beta 4 hat which is 1.201 so that gives us a confidence interval with lower bound of negative 0.740 and upper bound 4.114 so this is the 95% confidence interval so what would be the effect of changing the alpha it would be changing the amount of confidence we have that our confidence interval contains the true but unknown coefficient. So if we wanted to build a narrow confidence interval, that would be at the price of less confidence, larger alpha. Or if we wanted, if we are prepared to have a wider confidence interval, we could have more confidence that the true coefficient is contained, but that would be for smaller alpha.
Let's think about the interpretation of confidence intervals. Just as p-values, the interpretation isn't straightforward and you have to be quite careful. So here is the interpretation which is correct. Let's assume we had 100 samples of which we only see one here. Okay, So if you had 99 more of these samples. So if we had 100 samples, then if we calculate a 95% confidence interval, we should expect that 95 of these 100 different confidence intervals contain the true but unknown beta 4. So this is the correct interpretation. It's important to recognize it's the confidence interval that is random and it's not the beta 4 that is random. That's fixed and we're chasing after it. So here is another question from the midterm test that um, some students struggled with. It's basically about understanding zero conditioning mean assumption. So for that it's important to say just a little bit more on the variables which so far we've been pretty uh, I've been pretty quiet on here in this clip. So fat is the fatality rate per 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, unrate is the state unemployment rate. Then we have YDR and MPP and jail as additional explanatory variables. So now the question is a question on the coefficient on the unrate on coefficient on the unemployment rate and the common theme of all of the answers are is that it relates to what is required to once we've estimated the coefficient interpret this as a causal effect causal from the unemployment rate to the fatality rate so it's a high unemployment rate cause more fatalities say so option A says, well, yes, we can if the errors are normally distributed with constant variance. So it refers to this assumption about the U, that they are normally distributed with constant variance. That, so the variance is sigma squared. We'll talk more about non-constant variance later. Now, this assumption is really only important for small sample inference. So Previously, we used t-tests and we uh, used the um, decrease of freedom. It was 42 earlier, so it's fairly small samples. Then we need this assumption. C said what we need is that the expected value of u conditional on unrate is unequal to zero. So I think most of you recognize that it's wrong. What we actually need is that the conditional expectation of u is actual zero is actually zero okay so this is what we need this was our zero conditional mean assumption so c was clearly false d there are no circumstances under which we would be able to interpret the estimated coefficient as causal now that is also not true it can be pretty hard to make a causal statement but sometimes we are in a lucky enough information that we can and that is if the unemployment rate is an exogenous variable. In fact, what we also want to know is that there's a sensible mechanism leading from the unemployment rate to the fatality rates here. So there should be a plausible relationship between the dependent and the explanatory variable in question. So and if that is true and the variable is exogenous, then any estimated effect can be interpreted as a causal effect. So to illustrate that, let me just draw a little diagram. So we have the fatality rate as the dependent variable and we think the unemployment rate may have an impact. But then there may be something in this error term and I'm ignoring the other three exogenous variables for this explanation. And Part B, if the question gives you an information of what that could be, it could be the percentage or the proportion of the population in a state that lives in an urban environment. So let's say you can easily imagine that this would be important to explain fatality rates, perhaps more traffic there, more 
um, more fatalities or closer denser traffic so if that is relevant for the fatality rates it will end up in the error term because we haven't included it in the model the question is now whether u rate and u are correlated now we think that it's possibly quite um, plausible that the percentage of urban living and the unemployment rate may be correlated and that would mean that the unemployment rate and the error term are correlated and this means that the unemployment rate is not exogenous it is endogenous and in that case any estimated effect cannot be interpreted as a causal effect